This program contains mature images. Viewer discretion is advised. Worldwide, one-third of males and 5% of females experience permanent genital modifications due to heritage practices. Today, I'll look at several questions, what is done for each sex, where it happens, why, and the questions of origins and future trends. As a cultural medical anthropologist, my own research started with female genital cutting in Sudan. There, Loving parents make the arrangements for genital cutting not to hurt their children or oppress women particularly, but rather to follow what they believe is right and honorable. They are protecting their children's futures, making them ready for moral life as members of their communities so they can marry and have children. Women organize the private events for one or two girls usually when they are about five to seven years old. It's celebratory, performed by a midwife, with protective rituals like the wearing of henna and special ritual ornaments, and it may involve a meal and visitors. In other communities in Sudan and elsewhere in Africa, though, there's great variety in the techniques used, the extent of cutting, and the ages. In some places, it's a group rite of passage with far more elaborate rituals. The World Health Organization developed a useful typology for female genital modification illustrated on this slide. Most cutting is type 1 or type 2, clitoridectomy or excision. These cut either the preface and or tip of the clitoris, or they take part of the inner labia. Type 3 is the most severe type. It involves more tissue removal and partial closure or infibulation. This infibulation covers the vaginal opening and the urethral meatus, and as a result, urination, menstruation, intercourse, and childbirth are complicated. About 10% of cases are type 3. There's also a type 4 not shown on this diagram that includes pricking, piercing, stretching, or scarring. The World Health Organization calls all of these types female genital mutilation, FGM. But scholars have not found an intention to mutilate or harm, so we prefer the terms modification, cutting, alteration, or sometimes FGM slash C for cutting. Today, all forms of female types are declared human rights violations, and there are extensive efforts to monitor and end them. UN organizations have collected data to create maps, such as this one, showing the main countries affected and the prevalence among females from 15 to 49 years old. The highest prevalence is in the red countries, over 80%, and most severe type is common in the countries of the Horn of Africa, Somalia, Sudan, Ethiopia, Djibouti. Although people tend to think of female cutting as an attempt to oppress women, it is not found anywhere on its own. It's always accompanied by male cutting. Male genital modifications are also of different types. Unmodified, the glands is covered by the foreskin, as in the top left of this diagram, except during erections. Modified foreskins expose all or part of the glands, even when the penis is not erect. In the U.S., most of us are familiar with male circumcision or cutting around, as illustrated in the top row. Another type is superincision, where a slit or V-shaped cut is made on the top of the foreskin. It's of varying lengths, which results in the glands being visible but partly covered. Here's an example of this type in a 4,000-year-old illustration from the ancient Nile Valley from the Battle Palette. Superincision is also reported ethnographically in the Pacific and the Philippines, where it's also believed to be quite ancient. Subincision is a third major type of modification which achieves a widened, flatter penis 
by cutting a short or long slit from the urethral meatus downward along the underside of the shaft of the penis, sometimes extending all the way to the scrotum. The slit opens the urinary duct, producing hypospadias that change the flow of urine and semen. Subincision is found ethnographically in Aboriginal Australian cultures and some South Pacific cultures, and it is believed to be quite ancient as well. The prevalence map uses the term male circumcision for all types. It's common in more countries than female genital cutting, and the levels range from 0 to 20% in the blue countries to 80 to 100% in the red countries. Less common modifications of the penis are the embedding of small objects under the skin of the penis for sexual enjoyment, reported in ancient India and contemporary Caribbean countries. Piercing of the penis was also practiced in Borneo and the Philippines. Today, both implants and piercing have been resurrected by some so-called modern primitives as individual practices for sexual pleasure. Outsiders have long wondered why these seemingly unnecessary, often painful, and potentially harmful practices ever began, and why have they become so common in human cultural heritage? Was there a single origin that spread, or many separate inventions? Physical evidence of early origins is elusive, since cutting only affects the soft tissue, which is not preserved in fossil records. There's some evidence from later complex mortuary practices like mummification, but it does not provide much detail. Art is another source, but Upper Paleolithic and Neolithic art is not explicit enough. The penises depicted here from Paleolithic art, for example, are usually erect, with the glands showing, but both circumcised and intact penises look that way when erect. These Paleolithic specimens from various sites show the difficulty of determining if circumcision is present. Similarly, artistic representations of female genitalia in rock art generally do not have enough detail, as these Paleolithic examples show. In our chapter for the Oxford Handbook, Tom Blanton, Kathy Spiezer, and I concluded that the ancient evidence for two distinct types of male genital modifications in the eastern Mediterranean and Nile Valley meant there were at least two separate origins, both in evidence by 5,000 years ago. The circumcision type was found in the Levant area. For example, this Neolithic carving from Jarmo, Iraq, this predated the time of the prophet Abraham, who both Muslims and Jews consider as having established its religious significance. Abraham is thought to have, to have lived around 1800 BCE, and the text about his covenant with God to circumcise males was written centuries later. Evidence for the dorsal slit type was found in the Nile Valley of Egypt, as depicted in the Akhbahor tomb at Saqqara, which dates back to around 2345 BCE, and in the palette of the battle from 3300 BCE. Of course, both types could have originated elsewhere and been adopted. Female circumcision, we found, was rare in ancient Egypt. Kathy Spiezer concluded it most likely entered from further south during the time of the Nubian pharaohs who conquered Egypt from present-day Sudan to become the 25th dynasty that ruled from 744 to 656 BCE. Its probable prior roots would have been in Sudan or other African lands. In short, evidence suggests that genital modification practices probably arose or culturally preserved, diffused, or died out more than once. Further support for the idea of multiple origins comes from an applied mathematics phylogenetic analysis developed by Gabriel Schiffa, Jan Zerzavi, Pavel Duda in, in 2022. They used data from the Ethnographic Atlas, the Standard Cross-Cultural Survey, and studied several genital modification practices, along with language and genetic branching data of people in different regions. Their method enabled investigation of theoretical explanations 
and experiences even in regions with subs without substantial archaeological or historic records. Shafa and colleagues argued that the various types were invented multiple times, diffused to other societies, and sometimes died out. They concluded that male genital modifications originated 17 times independently, probably first around five to 7,000 years ago in two clusters in Africa. The first cluster were the ancestors of the Niger Congo speaking people in Central and West Africa. The second were the ancestors of the Nilo Saharan, Cushitic, Semitic and Berber speaking peoples of East and North Africa. Australian Aboriginal practices could be equally ancient. Female genital modifications, they found, originated 11 times, always coinciding with or following the origination of male practices. They found that the more severe types of female cutting originated earlier than the other types, with infibulation probably first originating around 6,000 years ago among the ancestral groups of the East African, Nilo-Saharan, and Cushitic societies. Knowing there are likely multiple ancient origins in different places helps to unsettle the stereotypes that FGMC is particularly African or that it is associated with any one religion. Now, explanations for all of this are elusive, but theories have developed based on cross-cultural comparisons and contemporary surveys. Female circumcision, particularly the types that inhibit premarital sex, are often thought to have developed for reasons such as mate guarding, paternity certainty, or benefits of securing advantageous marriages through virginity evidence or ideas of sexual attractiveness. Male circumcision is thought to strengthen group identity, solidarity, and trust among men but whatever root explanations are used, current practices need a fuller understanding for their complexity and popularity. People value heritage practices and conform to cultural norms. These often include morality and religious expectations, sexual propriety, aesthetic preferences, and participation in valued rituals, such as the rites of passage to womanhood or manhood. They're reinforced by authority structures gender ideologies and role expectations, by peer pressure, ethnic identity markers, aesthetic values, and folklore even. There is usually wide social acceptance of the necessity and desirability of the rights, even though they are also sometimes questioned and changing. Diffusion of the practices happens when people emulate higher status groups for social advantage or when they adopt new identities, such as through acculturation or religious conversion. For example, when Islam spread to other areas of Africa and Asia, converts adopted male circumcision as a teaching of the faith. When societies without heritage female practices adopted Islam, their rites were often syncretized into the new faith and given new interpretations as upholding Islamic sexual morality. Although female circumcision is not required in most schools of Islam, many consider it virtuous, so converts from non-circumcising societies sometimes adopted the less severe forms and incorporated these into their lives as Muslims. Today, international organization and much of world public opinion opposes female modifications, considering them violations of the human right to bodily integrity. Treaties and laws are established to stop them, and the UN's Sustainable Development Goals aim to end all forms by 2030, rather optimistic on their part. Although medicalization is on the increase as people seek to make their heritage practices safer, WHO discourages this lest it prolong the abolition process. Rates are slowly declining in many countries, but the punitive laws are creating other social problems, particularly for migrants in the global north. I favor positive messaging and social marketing, offering choice 
reformers should not condemn heritage practices but rather encourage healthy choices and abandonment of practices in children one example is the salima initiative initiated by samira amin ahmed in sudan with positive uh, images of girls who are healthy and whole the message being you needn't do it the future of male circumcision by contrast is strongly promoted by the World Health Organization. This is based on hopes to reduce female to male transmission of HIV. It is controversial when male circumcision campaigns have sometimes coerced schoolboys to get circumcised, or when men get the false impression they are immune and need not use condoms, making it harder for female partners to insist on safer sex. But when the same human right to bodily integrity is promoted for boys, and where parents and doctors understand care for the natural penis, and when safer sex practices are encouraged against HIV, circumcision may be unnecessary. There are a few remaining questions and controversies. People often wonder, for example, if genital cutting impacts sexuality. Fortunately, while there may be some sexual advantages for both men and women to not being cut, Genital alterations generally do not impair sexual pleasure, orgasm, or reproductive potential, unless there is painful scarring or psychological issues. Even when the glands of the clitoris is removed, the larger body of clitoral erectile tissue is intact internally, embracing the vaginal walls. So even with infibulation, most women report satisfying sexual lives. Some of the lesser practices, like labia stretching, in their original context, were intended to beautify and enhance sexual pleasure. However, the aggressive condemnation of genital cutting in Global North discourse can also have a deleterious effect on sexual experiences. I should also mention the current controversy about genital cosmetic surgeries being marketed by plastic surgeons. There is growing popularity of clitoral unhooding, reductions of the labia, and vaginoplasty, some of which are little different from heritage practices that are banned, but they are defended as being done for medical reasons. While personal choice for adults is recognized, healthy normal vulvas vary a great deal, so I hate to see the genital cosmetic surgery being marketed with before and after photos on the internet suggesting to girls and women that their natural genitals are too big, misshapen, or the wrong color, and require correcting at great expense. And unfortunately, about one-fifth of the clients for labia reductions are underage girls. The real medical needs are for those living with the after-effects of childhood cutting, who may be seeking fistula repairs, deinfibulations, counseling, or other assistance. I hope this brief overview of the large and complex issues of genital modification has been helpful for stimulating our discussions. Thank you very much for your attention.